Before I start, does, uh, do you know where Langley is? Are you familiar with British Columbia? No. So some yes, some no. You have no idea. A little bit. Um, if uh, I live in Langley, so if I were to compare Langley, I kind I kind of compare like size wise to maybe like a Selkirk, um, except for we have a Costco, which in BC is a big deal to have a Costco. So um, it's um, it's about. 40 minutes away from Vancouver, depending on the traffic. It might take you 40 minutes, it might take you two hours, depending. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice little community. So not a lot of exciting things happen in Langley, uh, to be completely honest. So when, um, when this memory support community was being developed in Langley, it was a really big deal um, because um, well, I think a lot of us think of British Columbia as being a very innovative, um, kind of creative, granola, left-wing, lean province. Um, it actually can be very, very conservative um, in many, many ways, Langley in particular. So when we were talking about innovative memory care taking place in Langley, everybody was quite surprised. I wanted to start with a, just a couple of disclosures because obviously we're here for a not-for-profit uh, community housing conference. And I wanted to start by saying a few things. The Village Langley is a privately operated community. We are privately funded. So I just wanted to be very upfront with that. So people who live at the Village Langley are paying out of pocket. Um, this is privately owned land. Everything in it and on it is owned by a group of private ownership. Other disclosure is that um, it's not a money maker, so <laughs> they're not making a heck of a lot of money. This is not um, this is not a huge money maker, and and you'll learn why sort of as as we go along. So as we're talking about this too, I think that you'll find that this model is actually very doable. Um, it's a lot of this model of support is based on culture, and it's based on how you go about doing things as opposed to the cost of doing things. So you'll learn a little bit more about, um, about how we do this. Um, other things that um, I was hoping to be able to talk to you a little bit about today is you're wondering why is this woman coming today to talk to us about dementia um, and a dementia supportive community when you're focused on housing within the province of British Columbia. And I have to admit, I, I don't recall in the province of Manitoba how things work here, but I can tell you in the province of British Columbia, when we look at community housing, um, housing that is operated outside of that which is owned and operated by the government, whether we look at assisted living, independent living, long-term care or complex care, um, housing that is tied to mental health and addictions, um, or child care, you know, child care operations. Ours is all governed under the same act. It's all governed under the Community Care and uh, Assisted Living Act. So when we look at um, housing and cost, we all have to look at interpreting the same piece of, of legislation. Um, so for us, we have to navigate that same piece of, of, um, of, of legal act, and I would anticipate that yours is probably very, very similar. So if you're looking to look at new ways of integrative housing, you probably have a similar challenge on your hands. Um, so food for thought. So the village Langley itself, um, is really involves three levels of partnership. So we have our investors and our ownership group. So this is comprised of what I call the group of 12. We have 12 separate and distinct entities that make up our investment and ownership group. Um, these are either individuals or um, small businesses or corporations who have purchased our land. We, we sit on seven acres. It's actually a former elementary school. Um, that was up for sale that was already institutionally zoned. So we didn't have to worry about having to go to the Township of Langley and have our land rezoned, something that is always good for consideration when you are thinking about developing a housing project. Because rezoning land from agricultural land um, into institutionally zoned land or from 
um, residential zoning into institutionally zoning land is always um, very, very tricky to do. So something to consider. Um, our partnership also involved for Senior Living, who I work for. So this is the operator of the Village Langley. And then we have a third party, which is our not-for-profit end of the Village Langley, which is called the Friends of the Village Society. Um, and this is a third party organization who does a lot of community engagement on behalf of the village. Um, one of the things that the Friends of the Village Society does, which is great, is because, as I mentioned, this is not a huge money maker. Um, one of the things that they are able to do is they accept um, donations on behalf of the village that go towards some of the um, things that we would love to be able to spend money on, but you know. We, we don't have the funds to do. So purchasing, you know, maybe pieces of equipment um, that um, is the operator would be unethical for us to accept donations toward. These are things that they are able to do. They also do a lot of public speaking engagements on our behalf. They will do educational tours. We have a lot of visitors from out of country, from around the world that want to come see what we're doing. So they will host delegations from um, as far away from Germany, uh, Australia, Japan, these are delegations that they will host and do educational tours and visits on behalf of. So what do we do with the village? Um, so the village um, model, we enable a safe and enriched living community for persons living with dementia and cognitive impairment. So primarily we do host people living with dementia. Um, we are actually just about to welcome a woman to our community um, who is in her late 40s who is living with a severe brain injury, um, which um, she suffered at the age of 18. She's now 48 um, and she's somebody who we feel that we, we would be able to make a meaningful contribution to her life. One of our primary uh, features within our community model that we're able to offer is freedom of movement. Um, and I'll explain about that a little bit more as we talk about, about the village. Um, our community model offers a continuum of care. So a lot of the questions that we get from people when they have um, you know, their initial questions is, well, what can we offer in terms of span of support? So we offer support to people throughout um, their journey of dementia. So right from the beginning of their journey, we do try to um, encourage people to um, experience the village early on in their experience with dementia so that we're able to welcome them in um, to start learning the benefits of early patterns or formation of early patterns and early habits in dementia. Um, so we welcome them early on to provide assisted living supports, um, full support, full care, um, as well as end of life and palliation support. Um, the biggest thing that I think that we're able to offer people is that we focus on quality of life. So it's not just the physical care and support that we provide people, but our focus on personal fulfillment, um, dignity, choice, um, and independence. And again, we focus not just um, ensuring that people have a quality of life, um, but our role is to facilitate people's, people's ability to initiate that quality of life, right? And to direct their quality of life. We're gonna to get to more of a conversation on person-directed care versus person-centered care, which is really a hallmark of what we're able to offer. So there are really five key um, central tenets of what we base our program on that we're going to discuss. So the philosophic foundation of the village model, um, our guiding principle and practices, our physical space, which people always have lots and lots of questions about when they want to come visit the village, that this is what they want to see. Um, our people, our team, how we constructed our team, what we looked for in our team, as well as our partnerships, which is probably of, of large interest to you as you're talking about community housing models. Our main purpose is to demonstrate a different way to enrich the lives of people that we serve. So 
when people ask me routinely, what is your goal? My goal really is to present one option, a different option for people to consider. Our option is not the only way. It may not be the best way. Um, it is one option that might be a great way for one person or one family to enrich their experience with dementia. Um, our mission is to create a community where people with changed cognitive and or physical abilities can live their own best life and achieve well-being and fulfillment, whatever that means for them. And again, focusing on that person-directed care for them. Um, this can be tricky when it comes to working with families. So again, as we talk about um, presenting a different way, and we talk about creating well-being and fulfillment for what it means for them. That can be difficult when we're working with families who believe that they know what mom or dad wants, or they know or they believe what mom or dad would want today. And very often we find in dementia support is that mom and dad's preferences do change and so what we find when people age with other illnesses is that preferences may not change over time um, you know if I am aging with another ailment um, my brain may remain the same and so the preferences that I have today as a late 40s you know mother of two my preferences when I'm in my mid-70s may remain the same, if my brain chemistry remains the same. But as my brain chemistry changes, the preferences in my brain may change. So the things that I like to do today may actually not be the things that I want to do when I'm in my mid-70s. And so the things then that my kids might advocate for me and say, well, my mom, always liked to read for two hours before bed, I may no longer actually want to do. And I may be expressing to my caregivers that I don't want to do that anymore. Instead, I want to do this. I want to watch TV or I want to play cards or I just want to go to bed. And so very often we find when we have the new community member, the resident, the villager expressing something entirely different. We get into this kind of clash with the family member who is actually advocating for something that they truly believe in their heart of hearts, their loved one still wants to do, but they do not. And it can become very, very difficult because you don't, you don't want to disrespect the family member, but our role when we're doing different is to take direction from that person. So our goal is to promote a good day every day for each person. And again, as we're talking then about community living, community focus, and a person directed focus, a good day every day for each person may look different every day as well. So again, when we talk about dementia specific, because this is what we do, that good day also may look different every day. What was a good day for somebody yesterday, depending on that person, they may want something entirely different the following day. So this is something that we have to adjust our mindset to as well, is that may change each day. It may change throughout the course of the day. Um, so last week, on Tuesday, I, I slept at work. I spent the night that we have these kittens and they were having their spay and neuter that morning, um, and they needed to spend the night. And so they were going to spend the night in one of our households that provides complex care. I was gonna leave them overnight, and, and I asked the nurses if they could look after the kittens, because they had the lightest workload at the time. And they said, sure. And then they realized that one of the staff that was working that night has an anaphylactic response to cats. And I thought, oh. Okay, well, this isn't going to work. The other households that were open, two of them had dogs living in them. The residents had dogs living in them, and the dogs hate the cats. Okay, that's not going to work. And then the other household, their workload was such that it was bananas. Like at evenings and nights, they're, they're just, it, it's, 
it's not doable. Like to have any action on the plate is not doable. So I thought, okay, I'm going to stay overnight. We have a guest suite. I'll stay overnight and I'm going to look after the cats. I'm going to stay in the guest suite. So uh, the cats were fine. That was fine. So about 9.30 that evening, I thought, I'm going to go wander over. I've been there in the middle of the night. I know what happens at night. I know what happens during the day. I've never seen what happens in the evening. Um, in dementia care, what goes on between like 9.30 and 11 o'clock. So I went over, I'm in my pajamas. Our evenings and night staff wear pajamas. I've asked them to wear pajamas to work. Um, we live in, a, we work in a normalized setting, right? So this is normal for us to wear pajamas to work in the evening. So I go over in my pajamas and my house coat. And the people who I see during the day were very, very different in the evening. And so when we talk about a good day every day, one of the ladies who I see regularly, who is delightful in the evening, was not delightful. And so knowing what I know of her, I thought I'm going to offer her milk because she loves milk. And apparently in the evenings, she hates milk. And she threw it at me. And I thought, okay, this is not, this is not a good day for this. Per I thought I was offering her a good day which is a good day every day for this particular woman. I did not uh, provide a good day every day for this woman in that moment. If I had offered it to her earlier in the day, it, it would have been, right? So that is an example of where the good day in that moment was not a good day, right? Um, social relational models of support. This is something um, in any housing setting, I think, is really, really important to do. So in a social relational model of support, um, this is based on what you think it would be based on. It's based on relationships. So in our world, when we look at care, this is where we take the best of all of the models of care that I think probably most people are familiar with. We look at the, the Eden model of care. Are you familiar with Eden, Butterfly, Greenhouse? Do these, these are things that people, a little bit of yes, a little bit of no, okay. So if you look at, um, there's a lot of conversation when we look at care of older adults, conversations about Eden model of care, if you do some research on that, the butterfly model of care, the greenhouse model of care, and housing. And these three models of care all focus on several basic tenets. They focus on relationships, they focus on the central concept of home. They focus on that when we provide housing to people, one of the most important things is that the housing is delivered in a household model. So regardless of how many people living in that community, you may be housing, maybe you've got a thousand people to house, maybe you've got a hundred people to house, maybe you've got 200 people to house. The way that you structure that housing is you've got between eight and 12 people in a particular neighborhood. Um, so you might have a big building where you've got neighborhoods that might be set up. They might be kind of corridored off. Or you might have people, you know, stacked, it could be. Or they could be independent, separate buildings. In our setting, um, we were fortunate enough to be able to have people in independent, separate buildings. Some of the other philosophies of social relational models of support as it relates to housing are beliefs that every house should have a front porch because those are normalizing approaches within a household model or social relational models of support within a community dynamic. That every household or neighborhood should have a door, should have a front door. Um, that if you're using a household model of support, that when you have visitors that are entering your home, that they don't just walk in, that they ring the doorbell. So for example, within our community, our houses are separate, distinct households. I'll show you a picture in a bit. And the people who live in those households, they live in a household of 12. Our villagers, they have a fob to enter their households. But as a staff member, I never just walk into that household. I approach the house, I walk to the porch, I ring the doorbell, and I ask permission to be invited in. 
It might be a staff member who works in that household who, open, who answers the door. It might be a resident, depending on the capacity of the people who live there. And the reason I do that is because that's their home. I don't live there. I wait, I ask for permission um, to enter. And we do that with the family members of the people who live there as well, which is something really new to family members. And again, depending on who's living in that household where you work, maybe you're providing addiction support or mental health support. Um, or you're providing support for, uh, for women who are leaving domestic abuse, right? And you have other people that are visiting. But what it does is it shows a sign of respect for people who are living there. Um, in our situation, we have family members visiting. They find this very odd. They think, well, you know, I'm paying the bill for my mother who's living in there. But our message is, well, if your mother was living at her home in the community, would you just walk into her house? For some of them, they say, yeah, I would. Our feeling is what well, we don't hear. You know, again, it's that, it's, that, it's that rebalancing of power and respect for people who are living there. So we're focusing on relationships of respect for the home. Um, and again, focusing on the vision of providing an enriched living experience for each person, focusing on providing support um, in the right place by the right people in the right principle and practices. Another one of our focuses is, again, because we're providing care, when we focus on providing care in the right place, one of our central premises is that, um, you know, if somebody needs a medication, we're not providing it to them in a dining room. You know, very often when you walk into a care community, um, you might see somebody who's having a meal at the dining room and you see the nurse come up behind them and give them their medication in front of everybody else while they're dining. We don't do that. Um, or maybe they're sitting in a hallway, you'll see come up behind them and they'll give them, you know, they'll pop up the shirt and give them, you know, the injection in the belly. We wouldn't do that, right? We would give it to them in the privacy of their bedroom or we'd give it to them in the privacy of a doctor's office or something like that to make sure that we're providing, you know, preservation of dignity and space. So the enriched living framework that we base our model on, this probably is not new to anybody. Uh, regardless of whatever sector it is that you're working within. So this shouldn't be new to anybody. Um, I think what might be new is how we apply the enriched living framework when we consider it's all of its elements within the context of personhood. Um, and within the concept of community design and then how we incorporate these things within community enabling. So if we look at when we are designing a supportive community, we look at providing the very basic things that we need as human beings to feel comforted, right? The basics are food, water, comfort, shelter and safety and I think anybody who's providing any type of housing would agree that these are the very basic things that we need to provide and that more than likely all of us are providing right now. These are the basic things and these are the things that we provide to support physical well-being and care of people. The things then that are on top of that, that then develop from that as we develop community networks our identity and connection. We want to be building those things. If we're effectively providing comfort and shelter and enabling a sense of safety, then we should from those things be building a sense of identity and connection. Once we have developed a foundation of identity and connection, people should then be developing a sense of security. They should feel safe and secure within that setting they should then be developing a sense of autonomy. They should feel that they can then start making decisions for themselves. They can make informed decisions. From those decisions, they should be able to feel that they can then develop a sense of self. They can grow as people. They can stand on their own two feet. They can start making decisions to help them developing as people. Maybe they can make decisions to go back to school. They can make decisions to you know, uh, make career decisions. Maybe they can, you know, move on from whatever housing that you're able to provide. They can grow to develop growth in the community at large. 
They develop personal meaning. They develop a sense of self. They learn how to become of service within their own community. They can contribute to that community. And then from those things they feel like they have, they can live a life of meaning and purpose. They feel joy. So these are things that we are trying to develop within our own community as well. Now again, within our population, as we're working with people who experience dementia, how these things materialize and what they contribute look different for our population and our residents. So in our world, what we are enabling are people contributing within their household and the village community differently. So we are enabling a sense of community, connection, security, and autonomy by having people do things and reconnecting things that made sense to them. So for us, what we are doing is having people assisting with meal preparation, cooking, cleaning, sweeping, gardening. Um, we're having people, you know, where there's some, you know, some of our ladies who live there, they like to sew. If there's buttons that need to be reattached to sweaters, we'll ask them, would you like to help with that? We have some gentlemen who like to, to, um, to sweep up outside, do garden work. We'll ask them, would you like to help sweep the parking lot? Things like, you know, things like that, stocking of the general store, um, caring for the cats. Um, so doing things that are purposeful and meaningful to them, but they feel help them connect within the community. They feel purpose, they feel meaning, they're not bored, and they're re-engaging. So guiding principles and practices. So some things um, that we've discussed or that I've kind of introduced are person-directed living um, and person-centered care. So for us, one of our very, very, very central premises, and I've embedded some notes here, are the premise of person-directed living versus person-directed care. So person-directed living, I always describe as an approach. So we, all, we hear about person-centered care, all the time and how we need to provide person-centered care. To me, person-centered care is an outcome. Person-directed living is an approach. It's how we do things. So, and person-directed living, to me, always involves two things. Person-directed care should always, always, always be based on two things. It should always involve permission. It should always be based on a purpose. Um, and your outcome, if you're providing person-directed living or if your program is based upon person-directed living, it should always result in person-centered person care. That should always how they feel that the thing that they received was based upon them. Guiding principle number two, which can be really tricky, is as we talked about the social relational model of care and the household model of care, is that ideally, when you're developing community housing based on this model, is that the staff that are working within your households are dedicated, is that you have dedicated household teams. This is tricky to do. We are intending to have dedicated household teams. This is hard. Um, it, it is difficult, it really is difficult because you want, you, you want your teams learning from each other. What I'm finding is you start with the idea of having dedicated household teams, and it sounds fabulous, but what is tricky is trying to avoid the creation of silos, um, us versus them, our house does better than your house, um, people sort of running away and coming up with their own ways of doing things, um, people creating workarounds in terms of policy, um, it's, that's tricky. So we're working through those um, difficulties. We're three months in, so we're perfect. We're, you know, we're not perfect, so we're far from perfect. We're learning how to make that work. But um, our intention is to have dedicated household teams. So that's something you want to think about. Um, it's ideal. It is tricky. One of the other guiding principles that we really hold near and dear um, and this is working really well, is the concept of home. So again, when we're looking at best practice in community models of housing, is the concept of home and removing the concept of forced institutionalization. So incorporating things within this model that look and feel like things that you have 
in your home. So really <coughs> basic things like decor, you know, um, do you need to have couches that are made from plastic? Probably not, right? Like we want things that are easy to clean, but they don't need to be that really gross, hard plastic, you know, that's in the doctor's office that makes the back of your thighs sweat and nobody wants to sit on. <laughs> nobody wants to sit on that anyway, right? Um, you know, blankets. Well, if you've got a blanket, like a throw blanket over the back of the couch and we're you know, concerned about infection prevention and control, you can wash that blanket, right? Um, and it's more likely that people are going to use that communal living space if it looks and feels homey. If it looks institutional, no one's going to use that space. And if no one's using the space, then you're not going to develop a sense of community. So put in the comfortable couch that costs the same, if not less, than the, than the plastic couch and wash the blanket, right? Um, dishes. Right, the plastic dishes. Why are we using the plastic dishes? Nobody wants to eat on them, right? And they're they're more expensive than replacing the glass dishes that are going to get broken. Um, the you know again, depending on what type of care you're providing, in our world, you know when you go into the older adults or you know the seniors' homes and and they have those doors that lock and they have those appliques on the doors that are supposed to look like a bookshelf. You know, and it's supposed to pretend to look like a bookshelf, but it's supposed to hide the door. Nobody thinks that's a bookshelf, right? It's not hiding a door. Why are we doing these things? They don't look comfortable and homey, so why are we doing it in the first place? So if you're not going to have it in your home, why would you put it in somebody else's home? It doesn't encourage people to use the space. It does not encourage a sense of community, so why do it at all? Right? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, freedom of movement. This is a big one. So again, for us, we're really fortunate. I get that. We're on seven acres of property. We're very, very fortunate. For us, we have persons living with dementia. One of the big attractions to our space is that because we are um, really a gated community, when we have people at risk, people are concerned about them moving about in the larger community and becoming displaced, becoming disoriented, becoming lost. We know where they are within that community. We can find them. Um, if they are misplaced, if they are lost, displaced, we can find them. But the fact of the matter is, um, they may fall. Are they at a greater risk for falling? I don't know. You know, we're not quite sure. They're moving about, so they're probably more likely to develop muscle strength um, as opposed to muscle weakness from sitting in a chair all day. But they're walking around on concrete, so they're probably at greater risk for falls with injury. So if we are concerned that somebody is at a greater risk for falls with injury, we will have people sign a managed risk agreement. Um, but what's the greater risk is having people, in our mind, enclosed in a setting where we don't, quote unquote, let them out and banging on a wall or becoming sufficiently agitated that they're going to injure another resident or injure a staff member, right? So we balance that risk. Um, so when we look though at places where maybe you don't have seven acres, maybe you've got one acre or half an acre, I'm going to imagine that whatever space you do have, you have some form of yard, it's probably fenced, you can take the risk, you can open your doors and let people enjoy your yard, right? What is the risk to you? It's a matter of what risk are you willing to embrace? More than likely, um, the space that people do have is considered part of your licensed area. So I look at previous um, care homes that I have directed, all of that space was considered licensed space. So the care home that I directed prior to coming to the village, I did that. I opened the doors from the physical building. Surrounding that entire building was an eight foot fence that was locked. So I opened the doors and people walked around the yard. 
And I look back and I think, how come people weren't jumping up and down and saying, oh my gosh, this is so great and this is so innovative. Like, it was the same idea in terms of the use of the space. That's not rocket science, right? So these are things that are within a lot of people's control. People just don't think that they're able to take that risk. So it depends, I think, on your comfort as an administrator, um, whether or not you want to, to use that space. Um, you probably have space for a garden, right? Do you have some space that you can dig up in your yard and, and make a garden that people can plant a garden? You might not be able to use that garden produce. We can't use ours, so we talk about this amazing garden that we have. We can't use the garden stuff. It's a violation of the Public Health Act for me to serve that to people. Um, I'm quite certain someone's probably going to pull a carrot out of the ground and eat it. That's a risk I'm prepared to take, right? <laughs> but, but I can't eat, I can't serve that produce and put it on our menu. Um, but again, that's low risk, right? So these are things that we have to balance and calculate. Um, the embracing of normal. So we just talked about one of those things, the pajamas. Right? So when staff started, one of the things that we talked about was scrubs. Um, so again, in our setting, it's very normal for people to wear scrubs to work. Um, I said, why? Like, we're working in a setting where we're welcoming people to a home. We're saying, this is your new home. Do you wear scrubs at home? They're like, well, no. So well, why would you wear it in somebody else's home? We're fortunate we don't work in a union-affiliated setting. So if it stays that way, then we can say no scrubs. They don't want to wear scrubs anyway. Um, so I said, look, you know, don't please don't wear them. Please don't wear scrubs or yoga pants. Those are my rules. No scrubs, no yoga pants, please. Um, but um, they don't want to wear them. So when I said, and again, evenings, and when you're working evening shifts or nights, I would appreciate it if you wear pajamas. Like, please don't wear your negligee, right? Um, or what you would wear on your honeymoon, but wear appropriate pajamas um, and your slippers. Uh, and if you don't want to, that's okay. But again, it encourages people to, again, who have cognitive impairment to take that cue from you. Oh, it must be getting close to bedtime. You're in your pajamas. It also doesn't make them feel singled out that they're in their pajamas and you're not. It, it balances out that feeling of, of you know, power in relationships. Um, the kitchens. Again, when we look at housing models, our households all have a kitchen in them with a normal fridge and a normal oven and a normal stove. Our ovens and stoves have locks on them so that people can't just you know, automatically turn them on and risk a burn. Um, or risk putting water on to boil or things like that, but they have a normal kitchen. Beds are a big one when we talk about embracing normal. So again, depending on your setting, but if you're providing housing for people in the, again, a mental health and addiction setting, um, you probably have, you might have hospital beds, and I'll, I'll bet you, or if older adults, I'll bet you there's nothing in your regulation that says you have to provide a hospital bed for people. Ours doesn't say that. It says you need to provide a bed that meets the needs and preferences of persons in care. That doesn't say it's a hospital bed. And God forbid, even if you have a hospital bed, you're not allowed to have those rails up anyway, right? That's considered a restraint. At least in BC, that's considered a restraint. You can't have those rails up anyway. So why do you need a hospital bed? You might, if the use of that bed is used as part of that person's care routine, but it doesn't say you need a hospital bed, so why, why are we buying them? It makes no sense. So what we do is we offer people to bring their own bed. If it fits in the room and it's suitable for that person's care routine and it's ergonomically safe for staff to use. Some people do need a bed where you know, the head goes up or the, or the legs go up, maybe you need to manage swelling of the legs, edema, or what have you, but that can be achieved without a hospital bed. So again, embracing of normal. Really basic things. Um, meal times and meal customs. The big, huge dining room, that's really, really loud, right? And the, the banging of plates, right, to get the excess food off of them, to clear them on those big white buckets. Does that need to be done in the dining room? Do you do that in your dining room after a dinner party? Right, if you have 20 people over for Christmas dinner 
do you clear your plates in the dining room and bag them on that, on that big white slop bucket? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. So why do you need to do that in the dining room there? Right? So just trying to get people to think about what is normal in a regular residential household setting and how would you do it if this was your house and this was a dinner party that you were hosting. Um, doing different. So what I always say to the staff is that we are here to do different, better, or more. And we remind ourselves of this every day. When you those days and you think this is a lot, we took on a lot, is that you applied to work here and you chose to work here because you want to do different, better, or more. Um, because this really is a daily reminder, it's a daily challenge, it takes a lot of work. Um, and that this applies to everybody, and that means yes, even you. Because um, there's always the person that says, well, yeah, but does that really mean me? Yes, even you. And I say that to our ownership group. Yes, even you, right? So the person that, um, when we talk about different, better, more, the senior executive that walks in and says, where's my office? You don't have one. You don't have an office because we're working in a community setting. And so my expectation is that when you come to visit, you're not sitting in an office, you're visiting in the households to see what's going on. And if you want to sit and you want to do some documentation, you can do it right over there in the living room or at the dining room table like everyone else does. Oh, right? They think that, oh, well, that I didn't think that that would apply to me. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. So a lot of these things, different, better, or more, that means everybody. It means absolutely everybody. Um, asking why. So a question that we ask every day, and again, everybody asks every day, is to whose benefit? Um, so when you're thinking of redoing housing models, right, and building partnerships, why are you doing something? So you said at the beginning, you've got this, what, 400 and some odd million dollars. Say, well, do you want to use it to renew existing standing agreements? Yeah, you could, right? You could, and then you can continue with those standing agreements. That may be a great use of your money. I don't know, it's not my place, right? Um, but to whose benefit would that be? Is there a long-term benefit? I don't, I don't know. Um, but to whose benefit? Like, would you, when we're doing things, are we doing it to ease a, pro a process? Are we doing it because we need to do something because there's a compliance reason? Would you be in, in regulatory non-compliance if you didn't? Are you simply doing something because it's tradition, right? Because you don't, we've never challenged ourselves to do something different. Um, and when we're doing something as it relates to a person, do we have their permission to do it, right? So if you're doing something with, with a client, with a resident, are we doing something because they've asked us to do it? Or are we doing it because we think we need to? So again, in our world, if we're giving somebody a bath, really simple example, did they ask us to give them a bath? Did we ask them permission to give them a bath? Or are we giving them a bath because it's Tuesday and Tuesday is bath day? Do you know, like, so really simple. There's some of those things when we ask why they're huge questions, and then some of them are really simple questions, but they have the same, they have the same meaning. The other thing, and this is my big one, is language. And this is huge when we talk about culture change and doing something different when you're reinventing something or challenging yourself to think about the possibility of reinventing something is watching your language. So the big thing, and I really challenge you to think about this when you're talking about housing, is your language. Um, the big thing for me in our world is what I call the F word. Um, and this is facility. I hate this word. I hate the word facility. It drives me bananas. So, I refuse to use it. The F word is just offensive. And as soon as you hear the word, for me, as soon as I hear the word facility, it automatically silos things. So um, every time I hear the word facility, I will correct and use the word community. And I think automatically it just broadens. It broadens. So when we talk about housing, and you're talking about housing, I would, I would challenge you to think about what is a different word. 
What is a different word for housing? Is, is it a community? I don't know. It depends on what you're trying to do. I like the word being talked about co-op before. Um, if you're looking at cooperative housing, are you looking at intergenerational housing? These are different sort of terms that are coming up. Um, facility is a big one though. The other word, um, especially when you're looking at working with older adults or you're looking at addictions and mental health is the, is the B word. When you're talking about funding, the B word is what? You'll know it as soon as I say it, bed. Right, because you talk about funding. The word bed is traditionally tied to funding. Um, and I would challenge you to stop using the word bed, because as soon as you were use the word bed, again, you're locking yourself into the idea of funding. And then you're tying bed with funding to a person. And you're automatically then, whether we, whether we intend to or not, and I guarantee you're not intending to do this, or else you wouldn't be in this line of work. But then you're siloing a person with a dollar value. Right? So when we, instead of the B word and bed, we just talk about rooms. So when people say, how many beds do you have? We say, we have a home for 75 people. We have a home for 75 people. It's easier for us to do that because we don't get funding. Right? Um, and it kind of, people will look at me like, what are you talking about? And then I'll explain to them. And I don't know if they think I'm being preachy or I'm being British Columbian and granola. Um, I don't really care what they think about me, it's not my problem. <laughs> but, um, but those are two words that I often will think about. So then there's this picture, which is a little bit small, but this ties into my conversation about language. So this, this is my puppy. So obviously, it's the most amazing puppy in the world. Um, he is now 65 pounds and um, ate my couch last week. So he's no longer the sweet, beautiful baby that he was in this picture. He's a Bernadoodle. His name is Martin. Um, but the reason I use this picture to talk about language is um, people will often ask me when we talk about them programming is do we have pet therapy? And I always say no we don't. We do not have pet therapy. Because again in my mind when we talk about language and then we talk about institutionalization, we talk about medicalizing things. We have a variety of pets at the village. We have uh, so many people bring their dogs to work. I don't now, currently, because Martin is out of control. Um, and he pushes people down. Uh, and he's still got 30 pounds to go. <laughs> so, but we have tons of dogs. We have cats. We have a miniature donkey who comes. We have a miniature horse that comes. Our barn is almost done. We're getting some chickens. We're getting some goats. But we don't provide pet therapy because none of us are pet therapists. We're just a bunch of people who really, really love animals. Um, and in my mind, what we're doing is we're having people bring in animals to, just to hang out. And people, like animals, do so much to normalize a setting. And as again, we're talking about doing normal. Um, who doesn't just like to snuggle with a dog and have kisses with a dog and snuggle with a kitten? Um, so while you say no, we, we don't do pet therapy. The minute that we do introduce pet therapy, we'll introduce it in, in a therapeutic that's not a word, but in a therapeutic way. Um, and you'll know. I, I also use this picture to talk about art therapy. People ask if we have art therapy. No, we do not. We don't have an art therapy program. We have a really cool art program, but it's informal. People come in, they do art, we have clay. Um, we do painting, we do sketching, we do all sorts of things. We have a fabulous music program, um, but we don't use the word therapy again for those reasons because we're choosing to normalize activities. So that's the end of my preachy part. The space, everybody wants to know about our space. So this is our space, this is our seven acres. So this is a really great aerial shot. Um, of our land. So as you can see, super, super, super large space. Um, much more spread out than what you can see here. It looks pretty cramped. It's not. This is a better depiction of our actual space. So the buildings that you see, they're all named after trees. Um, the buildings themselves will give you a better um, depiction here. So what you'll see here, if you look at the back two, the top two, where it says cedar and cypress, 
These buildings themselves are they're technically a duplex. So these are single-story buildings. Um, we they chose our developer chose to do single-story buildings because again, for us, they were able to, from a cost perspective, they were able to do this. You absolutely would get a bigger bang for your buck if you did multi-story, absolutely would. In our setting, they felt that they wanted to get a homier feel by doing a single story. Um, and the duplexes, each side fits up, uh, 12 to 13 people, depending on the side. <laughs> And in the middle, you can see there's kind of, it looks like a little bit of a bridge in the middle. They're connected in the middle by a service area. I call that area mid-home instead of a service area. In that mid-home area, we have the community amenities, things like laundry, like soiled laundry, clean laundry. We have a medication room. We have a tub room. Um, a maintenance room like the boiler room and things like that and that's where staff come in so staff coming reporting to and from shift will come in that midsection and we do that so that the staff coming in aren't just entering into the household space like if you're visiting like if I were to go visit I would go to the front door and ring the bell and ask for permission like I like I had mentioned but if you're just sort of going in to check on something or you're reporting for shift, you would go in through that mid-home area. Each side of that house is just under 8,000 square feet. So they're quite large. At the very front of the community, you'll see where it says Oakwood. It's that black kind of dark gray building. That's our community center. So that's where we have a lot of our group um, community amenities. So in there we have the boring stuff, we have our administrative space, uh, nothing exciting happens there. We have um, uh, recreation space where we have like group um, activities, exercise classes, um, we do a lot of yoga, it's BC, what do you expect? We have a meeting room, we have a bistro, we have a pub, we have draft on tap. Um, that was a liquor license, that was fun to get. Uh, let me tell you, that was, that was great. Uh, we have a community kitchen, like a large commercial kitchen in there. We have a hair salon. That was another license to get, also delightful. Um, we have a general store. That was another license that we had to get. That was also delightful. Um, and, then, um, and then we have our households here. At the very back is the barn. Technically, that barn should have another license as a petting zoo. But I have discovered that if we call it a pet habitat, we do not have to get a pet and zoo license. So that's what we're going to do there. It's a pet habitat. So we're going to have to change our signage from barn to pet habitat. So at one point before we opened, no word of a lie, I had 21 different licenses that I was juggling. So this is the exterior of what a household looks like. Really nice, bright colors. So for us in dementia, we typically would use brighter colors. They don't show up quite as bright in the photo, but we use brighter colors so people can aid in, in pathfinding, wayfinding. So yeah, opening new doors. So as I mentioned, all of these different licenses, um, well, most of these different licenses are governed under British Columbia's Community Care and Assisted Living Act. It is a delightful piece of legislation further governed by the residential care regulation, and as of December 1st, further, further regulated by the assisted living regulation. We've got some changes coming there. We also had to interpret the Public Health Act. The Public Health Act for us governed anything to do with food, hair cutting, and uh, anything that could potentially poke a mucous membrane so <laughs> nails waxing like anything that you would do like in aesthetics for the salon um, and then the liquor license was was in BC is the liquor cannabis regulation board so 21 different licensing and what I so here's what I discovered really early on I was hired about a year ago um, and they had wanted to open just after the August long weekend I was a week late we opened um, August 9th. So I was a week late. I think that was pretty good. That was pretty good. So when I came on board, the first thing I discovered was that 
they had not started any licensing applications. So they had, the shovel had hit the ground, they had started the building, um, the, frames was up, the frames were up, um, they started the building, but they hadn't got any licensing applications yet. They got building permits from the township, but they hadn't started the licensing applications to actually do the care. So they, what they should have done was started licensing applications with the Fraser Health Authority on the complex care end. They needed to start licensing applications with the Fraser Health Authority on the public health end to serve people food. That's, the, that's a big one. You need to feed people. And we should have started licensing applications with the BC Assisted Living Registrar um, to provide the assisted living end. None of those things had started. I thought, oh dear. Okay, this is going to be this is going to be tricky. So this was my my role. Um, so what I then discovered was, okay, we had to get these things going. My bigger challenge was that the village had held this hype, and we had advertised that we wanted to do bif different, better, or more. But what I was looking to do was, it wasn't it wasn't the role to try to open the village according to what all the existing regulation was, was my role was I had to open the village and sort of demonstrate that we were legitimate, not within the existing structure, but by the people who governed the existing structure, right? So this is the challenge. If you're doing something different, you, you have to demonstrate that what you're doing is okay according to the existing standards but you're demonstrating that what you're doing is not being done within the existing standard already. So that's the fun part. So you need to be a little bit of a policy nerd, right? You need to know the policies and the procedures and the legislation that you're, that you're trying to open these things within. Um, and then you have to be able to demonstrate that it can be done, but you, but you need to be able to demonstrate that, because, that it's, it's okay to do that can be done safely, but it actually can be done differently. Right? So this took about a year. It started in November, um, and it lasted until August, just under a year. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is doable. And this is where, again, we had to ask a lot of the whys. Right? The hospital bed is a good example. It's a very basic example, but it's a good example. So the community design. So this is what we created. So as I said, a home not beds, a home for 75 villagers, three rooms to provide respite care, um, three rooms available for sharing, for double occupancy, only for people who wanted to share. So we would never put two people in a room who did not know each other. We currently have a couple um, who are sharing a room in licensed care or complex care, chronic care, I'm not sure what we call it in, in Manitoba anymore. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, in this situation, the couple has brought their marital bed. They've chosen to share a bed. These are high, complex care needs people, um, and they've chosen to bring the bed from the marital home. They're sharing the bed, um, which is like a whole new world, right? Which is it's nice to see. 25 of our rooms provide licensed care, and 50 provide assisted living. And this is our current community. So as of, well, Friday, I guess when I updated this, um, or Thursday night, we had 37 members of our community, so we're about half full. Uh, we have 14 men, 23 ladies. This is interesting, because typically in care, you'll see way fewer men than you do women. This is, this is a pretty good gender balance. Um, I think this is because we have a lot younger people, as you'll see. Um, our youngest person is 67, our oldest person is 95, average age is 82. Our largest group of people is between 81 and 90. Our second largest group is between 71 and 80. As I mentioned, we do have a woman who's going to be moving in shortly who is 48 uh, with a severe brain injury. Our youngest person prior to opening who was planning to move in was 58. Um, and that person um, ended up choosing to remain where they were just because they had developed a certain, a certain degree of stability. What we're actually finding, interestingly enough, is that our younger group of people are the people who have the highest um, degree of care needs. And our older group of people are the people who have the, high, or the lowest degree of care needs because of the degree of dementia. Right, so the dementias that tend to hit earlier on 
are the more, they're stronger, they're much stronger dementias um, that tend to have a higher degree of impact. Types of dementias, which may or may not be of interest to you. Um, we have 17 persons living with Alzheimer type dementia. Many of them are early onset dementias, as I mentioned. 12 persons, persons with dementia unspecified. Alzheimer's type dementia um, is, is, an, uh, is an estimate, right? Dementia with uh, Alzheimer's type cannot be 100% determined until after death with autopsy. Um, so 12 persons with dementia unspecified. Three persons with vascular type dementia, four persons with Parkinson's type dementia, and one person with Lewy body type dementia. And some stories that, again, we're talking about community. We're talking about um, things that happen as you develop a community, things that you can do differently. So some of the things that we've seen coming out of the community that we've developed that I love. Um, some common things that I think you see when you know you've done your job right. Um, these are my two favorites. One of them involves a very simple thing, it involves a fork. So we have a gentleman, a younger fellow, who has very, very uh, nasty Alzheimer's type dementia. And he, he has a very hard time eating and he's having a hard, very hard time figuring out how things work anymore. Um, he can eat, but he has a hard time around the dinner table. And this particular morning, he, he was really hungry, he really wanted to eat, but he could not for the life of him understand how to put the knife and the fork and the spoon together. And he was frustrated to no end. He could see everybody around him using the utensils. And he knew he was supposed supposed to, because that's what we're socialized to think, but he couldn't do it. And eventually he just gave up. And this woman, who's about 20 years older than him, was sitting beside him. She was a teacher. And she reached out and she took the fork away from him, and put her hand on his hand, and put his hand on top of the egg, and just said, you do what you need to do. And then he picked up the egg and just started eating it. And I, and I thought, well, the fir first thing I thought was, that's awesome. You know, this lady who's 20 years his senior was in this position of total non-judgment and was, I don't know if her intention was to coach him and to give him permission to say, you go ahead and you do what you need to do to eat. She recognized he wanted to eat, that he needed to eat. Or if she was just like, for God's sakes, put down your fork, you're driving me crazy, you need your egg, right? <laughs> like a cranky lady. I don't know, I don't know what her intention was. But what happened was he it validated him to whatever extent that he ate. That's great. But what impressed me more was that there were two staff members in the house that saw that. But the community that had been created amongst our staff team was that story got out. And all of the staff knew about this within an hour. And then all of the families of the residents knew about this. And this, you know, this got out, like this story of like validation and non-judgment was out right away. And everybody knew about this. And I thought, you know what, that's great. Like that, that is an indicator that we've created the kind of community that we wanted to create. The other thing, um, that very recently happened that I thought, okay, again, this is great. We've done what we wanted to do. Um, is we have a gentleman, he's a retired lawyer, and this man is, he wakes up at 6.30, and from 6.30 in the morning until he goes to bed at night, he perseverates, like he just, again and again and again and again, he, he repeats the same stories over and over and over again. So he, he believes that he is being unlawfully incarcerated, which again, I mean, he is in his mind, he's, he, I and mean, he is incarcerated, right? He's being held in a place where he doesn't want to be. It's not unlawful, but he is being held. True, fair. Um, he believes that he, um, he physically carried Terry Fox from coast to coast. He believes that he, um, he took down Lee Harvey Oswald. He believes in his heart of hearts that he physically removed John F. Kennedy's body from the road when he was shot. And he also believes in his heart of hearts that he rescued Marilyn Monroe from the Hells Angels Clubhouse in Coquitlam, British Columbia. So these are the stories we hear all day. And he's so concerned about all of these things, he needs to report them to the RCMP. And he is devastated by all of these things. He's so upset. And, but he can't let it go. And so he's, uh, he works himself up to the point where he won't eat, he won't sleep, because he, he has to tell the RCMP. 
And so we listened. You know, people were just listening to him, and we would take turns listening to him just to just to hear him out. So finally, like two weeks ago, I said to the staff, you know what, I'm going to call the mental health officer with the RCMP just to see, like, will they come listen to this man? Like, maybe they'll take a statement from him, just like, because he's the kind of guy he'll remember if something happened. Like, he'll know who he talked to. And they're like, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm like, well, let's just try, let's just try. So I phoned and I phoned and I phoned and I phoned and I phoned him. Eventually, they came. They came, and I, and I explained to them, this is what's going to happen. Like, will you come? You're going to actually have to submit this incident report. So, like, you're going to have to follow through on your end and do this paperwork. It's going to create a lot of work for you. They ended up coming. They came. And they listened. It took two hours of their time. I had to give them lunch and stuff. Um, but they came, and they filed the report. And then they came back and they did the follow-up with him. And he's still going on and on and on about the story. But he's not upset about it anymore. And now he walks around with a copy of this RCMP incident report. And he's, he's still upset about these incidents, but he's not upset because he knows the RCMP came. He's like, okay, they're finally going to do something about it. And I thought, okay, this is awesome. Again, sense of community, something that we did right. Right, something that we've done right. And again, it's just this sense of we're on the right path here. We've created something good. Community space, this is the inside of one of our households. This is before anybody moved in. So you can tell, because everything's clean and organized and tidy. <laughs> you can also tell it's privately funded based on the beautiful lighting and stuff that's in there. But this is some of what we've done. We created big open spaces, lots of natural light. In the case of dementia, very specifically, to create a sense of openness, not feeling confined. Natural light to help promote lots of uh, natural melatonin production for people, helps with uh, circadian rhythm, sleeping. Living space. These are models. These are actually people who live across the street. Uh, came over to do some modeling course. This is an example, though, again, of neighborhood design. When we talk about those philosophies I mentioned to you earlier, Eden, Butterfly, um, Greenhouse, that you, I'd really love you to look up and take a peek. Um, but the reason why we did this with the island is just probably at your house, right? When you have people over for dinner, where does everybody hang around? When you're trying to get your dinner party going and you wish they'd get out of your way and they don't, it's the same thing here. So this is where we will have uh, villagers or residents. They will sit around the island. They will help our staff put together a salad at dinner time. Um, they will help um, make sandwiches at lunchtime if they're able to and if they want to. Um, they will help butter toast at breakfast time. They're included in the running of that household. Gives people a sense of purpose and inclusion and involvement. Um, every house has a sunroom. A quiet place where people can just be. Um, there's no TV in this space. People will come here, they will read where they're not able to read and physically, you know, uh, cognitively, they will enjoy the social custom of reading. So you will see people just leafing through a book, leafing through a magazine, just maintaining that custom. This is a bedroom. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a couple of double rooms, but um, everybody has their own private space. This is a luxury, I understand, in, in many housing models, but um, the belief is that people should have some space, some private space, where they can just go and, and call their own and have personal objects and be able to personalize their space. We encourage people to bring their own things from home. So, and hang those things up before they move in. So that when they move in, it's already their space. They have their personal clothing, they have their personal family pictures, their personal toiletries, like your hand creams and your lip balms, all those things that you know make your space your own. And our outdoor spaces. Um, we're really fortunate to have the space that we do. So this is just where people go and walk. We, again, people in my belief, especially with a dimension, need, they need that physical outlet. They need to move. When you see people with dementia walking around and banging on the doors, it's because they physically need that outlet. Um, it's just, it's, it's a physical desire right, that people have. This is the actual one of our streets that we have, we call it Main Street. We're really fortunate. Um, somebody donated this adapted bike to us. So it's a two-person bike. 
um, that gets used a lot. We're, again, quite fortunate with our weather as well. We very rarely have snow where we are. Um, and this bike gets taken out in the rain all the time. Um, and we're paved. We, most of our roadways there are paved. So people will take this out. Um, but this is a really great, great open space. Um, we've got about, if, you, if they were to run around all of the, the streets, it's about 2K. It's about 2 kilometers. Um, again, another just outdoor space where people will go and just be. Our staff, so um, our staff in Confluent within the community, um, these are the people who we think are right for our team, right? So we believe in servant leadership, which is really the equivalent of public service, right? So within the private sector, servant leadership is people who believe in serving other people. We believe in a commitment to public service. Um, we believe in doing the right thing for other people. Um, we've hired people specifically who have a passion um, to want to help other people for the right reasons. We have a very compassionate, flexible team. Again, we are non-union affiliated. We'll see what happens there. I'm an HR person by trade. We'll see what happens whether or not the staff want to pursue the, the, the unionized option or not. Our staff typically are very creative people. Um, they have to be. They typically do very non-traditional roles. So you will be a nurse, but you will also clean. You will be a healthcare aide, but you will also cook. You will be an administrator, but you will also weed. <laughs> you know, so um, we all do a little thing of ever, a little bit of everything. Um, our staff all do have formalized education in dementia practice. We know a lot about dementia, how it progresses, dementia types, um, dementia symptoms, dementia support. This is our barn. Our garden area that I mentioned. Community center. This is a nice night view. Our pub back there. Our general store. We use our general store for a lot of things when we talk about community. Um, typically what we use this for here is to stock our households. So uh, when we talk about participation and community involvement, we have a lack of storage. Everybody has a lack of storage when you're building new space. So what we typically do is we use this store um, for, we store a lot of our dry goods in there as well as fr uh, fresh produce and some toiletry items. Um, so very often in the mornings and then again in the evenings, um, residents, villagers, or staff will come into the general store and they will see what they need in the households. Um, and so this is of no additional cost. This is included in monthly resident fees. So they will say, you know, for breakfast tomorrow in the households, we need eggs, we need bacon, and we've run out of milk. They will come down to the general store. They will take it out of the stock and they will return it to the households. We've got grocery carts. Um, so sometimes villagers will come down with a list that the household staff have made for them. Or we'll have villagers who will come down and say, we need soap. We need shampoo. They will come down, they'll pick it up, they'll bring it back to the households. Again, it, it provides them an opportunity to engage in regular things that you and I do every day that you know, we may grumble about, but they're regular things that we're used to doing that give us a sense of purpose and meaning that people miss doing when they're not doing them anymore. Um, it's also a great way for us to manage our storage. We have a few things in there that we do charge a fee for. So as I mentioned, we have some residents who have small dogs who live there. So we will go to like the, you know, the grocery store and pick up dog food, and then we will charge them a fee. Like it's a very, like we'll just charge what we pay for it, but we'll add that onto their monthly billing. Um, we have a few people who like to uh, drink wine. So we will have wine in there. If it's not medically contraindicated, they want a bottle of wine. They want to bring it, you know, bring it back and have some wine with their dinner. Um, they'll buy a bottle of wine and they'll bring it back and do that too. Um, but um, the store is a quite a little popular spot. We have ice cream in there, again included in resident fees. They'll go down, they'll pick up an ice cream and uh, enjoy that too. So it's also kind of a gathering spot. Hair salon, this is before we had it stocked. Um, so it doesn't look very exciting, but this is one of the things I was talking about. So we do a full service hair salon, barber services, um, aesthetics, very, very, very popular spot as well. The fire pit, I have to admit, I haven't turned it on. I'm really uncomfortable with this. This is where my risk 
tolerance is really low. <laughs> so um, our developers did put in an outdoor fire pit because they felt that this was something from a community perspective is something that a lot of natural communities would have. This makes me really nervous. Maybe, maybe one day I see liability written all over this, but <laughs> we'll see. First question, how do you measure your success? Uh, have you ever surveyed your residents and their families? Second um, question, how do you deal with wanderers? Good, good question. So uh, exactly right now, we are doing a resident satisfaction survey. Uh, so it actually launched last week on the 12th. It wraps up this Friday, so I'll let you know the outcome. Um, for me, on like, qualitatively, uh, currently, like I've been keeping track of complaints and compliments. I, I, I'm somebody, I observe a lot, I walk around and I look. So in terms of complaints, the com you know, complaints that I've received so far, you know, I've had one complaint from a family member. Um, around the like, cleanliness, you know, they think that the room should have been cl cl cleaner. I do take a grain of salt in that because this is privately funded, we, we, have, um, we have people of privilege who, uh, who are used to a very high standard of living. And so I take, I take some of the concerns with a grain of salt. I've received no complaints at all with regards to quality of care, standards of care, or how people are treated from a dignity perspective. Um, but, you know, if I have concerns around, um, you know, things that I have seen, right, how, I, you know, I think maybe staff could have talked to somebody in a different way, um, you know, um, attitude, things like that, I deal with that on a, you know, immediately, you know, to, like on a one-on-one on -one basis. Um, but the satisfaction survey, I'm curious to see what comes out of that. Um, wander, wanderers, people who are wandering, we haven't had anybody physically exit yet who, who, wasn't, who, who shouldn't have. I haven't seen that happen yet. And again, because of the community itself, the way that it's laid out, um, we quote unquote, and I don't know another word for it yet as we talk about language, we're developing this language. We haven't had anybody move around the community who isn't allowed to. Because we're on our the property that we're allowed, you know, that we have, we permit people to move around. We we have technology that people wear. We know where they are, and so our comfort level is that, you know, if if we do not feel that you are safe to mobilize around that seven kilometers, we will not take you. Or if we feel that you are unsafe but your family is okay with that risk, you will, sleep, you will sign a managed risk agreement. We haven't had that happen yet. Is the cost factor equivalent to other facilities or for the need of a specialized Yeah, good question. So is the cost factor equivalent to other communities? My F word, he said the F word. Um, it, it actually is, yeah, so it, it is. So in, in BC, um, this is what I am told, and, and, I, and I believe it to be reasonably true. I'm, I'm fairly well familiar with the market there. In BC, the, the average cost of a, of a bed, I'll, I'll use the B word, the average cost of a bed in long-term care in BC whether it's publicly or privately funded, the average cost to, to run a bed, when you look at your overhead, including you know, you, your labor, your food, your, you know, your hydro, your gas, your heat, your land, property taxes, all of those things, is about $7,300 a month ballpark. The difference is in a publicly funded scenario, the government covers a good chunk of that, and then depending on your income, the resident covers a portion of that. So as a, as a taxpayer, like if you were to go into a publicly funded bed, you would pay like, I can't remember the exact amount now, but anywhere between let's say like 1500 and I think $3,800 a month out of pocket. Um, our rate at the village currently for in long-term care is 8,300. So it's, it's more, than what it what it takes what the actual bed cost is but by about a thousand dollars more so it certainly is more but you know if you were to go to 
other care communities, you would be paying $12,000, $10,000. So it's less than what you would pay in some communities, but it's more than what you would pay in others. We don't have any subsidized where we are. So, but yeah, if you were to go to a subs, if you were to pay the highest rate for a subsidized room, you would be paying less than four thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But the highest rate that you would pay, probably in a privately funded somewhere, could be up to like just over twelve thousand dollars. There's a really wide spread. We had a board planning session and we were talking about whether or not our providers see themselves as housing providers who also have some type of support or program or programs and, and housing support people that also have housing. And our, one of our board members, Joanne, said, uh, we're a community. We provide community. And that really stuck, stuck with me and I, I can really hear that in the, in the village and I think there are ways that we can adapt that, um, that community environment um, uh, as much as we can, change our language and change the way that we do things uh, so that we can make sure that we're providing good communities so every day is a, is a good day for everyone.